we're going to get started. Um, okay. We this is the twelfth time we're meeting. We meet every week. I see we have some new guests today. We have guests coming from South America uh, and from California and Boston, and soon we'll have people from Montreal as well. Um, but the reason for getting together is we wanted to share the medical facts so that the decision makers of our nonprofit organizations, our clergy and representatives from Armenia could make decisions based on fact. Uh, and it's been an amazing 12 weeks as we've marched through um, the ups and downs of COVID-19. I also want to welcome no, our, our guest, uh, Dr. Vartan Gregorian, who's the president of the Carnegie Foundation, and will be introduced to all of us in a few moments by Dr. John Belazikian. Uh, because of the changing world situation and South America now overtaking North America in cases and Brazil specifically taking over the U.S., uh, we have our esteemed colleagues from South America, Dr. Stambulian and Dr. Elmasian, joining us. Um, we, uh, a lot of things have happened over the last 12 weeks, a lot of ups and downs, but one of the consistencies here has been the recognition of our healthcare providers, our first line providers, uh, and we see outpouring of support everywhere with banners out of windows, posters in front of yards, uh, at seven o'clock in New York and 11 o'clock in California, screaming, shouting, pans beating, and car drive-bys. Uh, this is a tribute outside of one of the New York hospitals seen this week, uh, thanking the healthcare workers. Uh, at Mount Sinai, uh, we again appreciate every single life that's saved is, is terrific. Uh, there's such focus on every individual survivor of COVID-19. On the wall, you see a flower <clears throat> planted for every single person that's left the hospital alive. Uh, today was a very sad day for the Armenian American Health Professionals Organization. Uh, one of our dear friends, a board member, colleagues, and mentor, passed away. He was someone with an energetic warmth that he shared with his humor, his guidance, uh, and his presence, all which will be greatly missed. His life was dedicated to his family, to his patients, uh, and to all, to his friends and all facets of the Armenian cause. His passionate pursuit of everything that he was involved with led to a lifetime of accomplishments which earned him the respect and admiration of all of our communities. He was recognized with one of Apo's greatest honors, an ambassador to medicine and to humanity. Uh, all of our prayers and our thoughts are with him and his family. He will be greatly missed. We are at a very interesting crossroads uh, as we approach uh, week 12. Um, we see uh, a mixed feeling here in America of a closed economy, the fear of the virus, the fear of poverty, the ramifications of not working, uh, the healthcare consequences, the economic consequences, and the desire to open up. Uh, but we've come a long way uh, in 12 weeks. Uh, we've seen uh, the number of cases in the world uh, increase from when we started at 118,000, now approaching close to 6 million. So this week we'll pass the 6 million mark from literally 118,000 during our first meeting. Uh, when we first started, there were uh, 3,000 deaths, and now uh, 358,000 people have died throughout the world. In the United States, uh, the number we've unfortunately taken the lead in the number of cases uh, at 1.7 million cases, and I think this week will probably be eclipsed by uh, uh, Brazil. Um, we had, uh, when we started, 29 deaths. And now we've had 101,000 deaths. So we passed that grim mark of 100,000 people passing away. Uh, on an average week, over the last 12 weeks, we've had 143,000 people get the infection and about 8,400 people pass away. Uh, I think the biggest uh, area now, uh, as the United States is uh, stabilizing, is we're seeing a resurgence of the disease in Brazil, Peru, and Chile. Uh, particularly Brazil has been really hard hit. So uh, a little later on, I can't wait to hear from our South American colleagues about our Armenian friends in South America and what's happening. I think one of the hot spots that we are uh, going to be paying more attention to is Africa. Uh, right now it's only 4%, but it's rising. And some of the most vulnerable poor populations are in that area. And people with lots of comorbidities like HIV, we know the supply chain for their medicines has been interrupted and over a half million people may die uh, from the lack of their access to medicine. 
Um, on the medical front, uh, we are seeing just a great outpouring of research, uh, of clinical work, uh, resulting in more saves. Uh, we see a lot more studies that are showing antibodies may actually uh, help uh, be a significant treatment. Uh, we see some studies now they're isolating the antibodies which are most effective. And uh, hopefully when we have those antibodies, we can clone them and, and give it to patients so they can survive uh, some of the health consequences of COVID-19. On the vaccine front, uh, we're seeing more entries into the vaccine market. Last week was a huge week when we saw the results of Moderna's uh, results, a phase one results showing promise. That joined the uh, ranks of Oxford, which previously had showed promise after their phase one results. Uh, we now see a new company called Novo Novax joining the uh, ever uh, growing number of companies nearing 100 that are developing vaccines. So where we thought vaccine development was something that would take 10.3 years on the average, uh, we see hope that one of these vaccines uh, may actually work in much shorter time. Um, in terms of uh, social distancing, we are seeing a loosening of standards and uh, we saw things over this Memorial Day holiday weekend that really were disturbing where we saw large groupings of peoples on beaches and, and other areas and we're just kind of holding our breath that in two weeks or so we won't see a resurgence of disease and a tightening of where we are. So in terms of uh, what else is happening on the entertainment front, <clears throat> we see that Universal Studios will be opening in Florida on June 5th. Uh, Lego World uh, will open up on June 1st and Disney's talking about opening up on July 11th. And the National Hockey League is gonna finish its 2019 season. Uh, so we're excited by that. And uh, now I'm going to introduce our panelist, uh, Dr. Kojiglanyan, uh, who is going to be talking about the medical developments. Thank you so much for joining us again. I want to thank you, Dr. Kojiglanyan, for all of your efforts over the last 12 weeks in this and many other endeavors helping our community. Uh, this is an honor to be here today. Uh, it's a difficult day, as Larry mentioned for us. We have lost a tremendous friend and pillar of the community. So it's a little bit emotional and we're happy to have other pillars uh, and to be among you guys today. Um, I am a pediatric infectious disease specialist um, since Dr. Gregorian and a few others don't know me. So uh, I just wanted to uh, touch base uh, my few minute update from last week. Uh, the good news remains that uh, the pediatric population under 18 years old really constitutes a very, very small percentage of all positive cases, really 3.7% to be exact. So so we are happy with that. And uh, if you uh, all remember, we talked about this multi-inflammatory syndrome in children that we were seeing uh, from the beginning of May. And I'm happy to say that we are seeing a reduction in the number of those cases, which reflects and is parallel beautifully to the uh, number, total number of both adults and um, incidence re reduction in our states. So it proves the point that it was related uh, temporarily to COVID-19. And as we are seeing a total numbers decline, uh, those pediatric cases are also declining. Another interesting study that came out from a colleague of mine who's now in Mount Sinai that might be in, of interest to the physicians here is that um, and they went back and looked at the ACE2 receptor, which is really the receptor that the virus uses to enter uh, cells. Uh, and they found that in children, uh, the, the ACE2 receptor expression in the nose is much, much less than that in adults. As, uh, as we grow older, the ACE2 receptor expression increases. And that might be a reason why, again, we are probably going to just see kids with upper respiratory, but not... Uh, progressing to lower respiratory disease or pneumonia or severe disease as we are seeing in adults. So that was published uh, this week in JAMA. Uh, as far as diagnostics, uh, we have, uh, you know, discussed this amply. Uh, things have not changed. You have the nasal swab for PCR viral detection and antibodies uh, to be used after recovery. And we're not going to touch on the antibody today. Nothing has changed in that front. But I want to say that, again, there is much more testing available now than where we were in March and in April. So anybody who has any symptoms uh, suggestive of COVID-19 should go get tested. And even if you have no symptoms, but you have active 
a known exposure to a COVID-19 uh, case, please go get tested. Now that, as Larry mentioned, the reopening is going to start, doctors are going to go back to their clinics. If you, know, uh, if you know of a known exposure, please go ahead after three to five days, not just the, not the next day, but three to five days get tested as well. Because again, more and more data is showing that uh, the asymptomatic uh, the carriage of this virus is pretty common. We don't know yet the total number, but there's more data uh, uh, implying that there is a substantial percentage with asymptomatic uh, uh, viral um, disease. As far as therapeutics, uh, this week we actually finally got the preliminary results of the NIAID study published with Remdesivir. And again, uh, no surprises there. There is modest uh, improvement uh, in recovery uh, in those who receive this drug versus those who don't. This is an intravenous drug, as a reminder, so it can be given only at this stage when you're hospitalized. But the conclusion really is that if you are already very sick, uh, intubated, then the drug is not going to have any benefit. So the sooner we give this drug, as soon as somebody enters the hospital, or even looking at someone who has comorbidities and is not hospitalized yet, that's where this antiviral drug is going to be, uh, you know, most effective. And, and, and really, it is so far the only therapeutics that has been shown in controlled randomized trials to have a, a modest effect. And from the preliminary result, it seems uh, that it also has a mortality advantage, meaning if you start this drug early, you will uh, save lives. And then the other big news you might have heard about is the hydroxychloroquine news. You know that this was being used, you know, even in the medical field and from non-medical people, including the president, as, as, hope, as, as some uh, sort of uh, drug that's going to really help with this disease. And yet we do have another study that came out this week uh, with uh, up to 15,000 people in that study. It wasn't a controlled trial. They just analyzed people who in the past three months who had taken this medication and really found out that in those groups uh, of people who received this drug, the mortality rate was higher. Uh, so this led to the WHO actually halting or suspending the arm of a large multi-country trial that was going to give hydroxychloroquine to patients. So again, um, you know, I must say again for the doctors among us, I have not, uh, I still see on clinicaltrials.gov that there are ongoing hydroxychloroquine trials in the US, especially for prevention. Uh, some of you heard the president taking it as prevention because he's exposed, he doesn't have the disease, but he's taking it as prevention. So those uh, trials, I still at least on the governmental website see that they are ongoing. So I don't know wh whether those are gonna be halted or not, but the message is that as we had talked about before, if the benefit outweighed the risks, then, then we should probably all you know, be more enthusiastic to taking it. But now several studies are showing that really there is no benefit and actually there is harm in taking this medication. So I want to conclude by saying that, as Larry said, we learned so much about this virus in the past two months, and we keep learning and very eagerly. But one thing has remained constant, that the transmission of this virus really is a, a, a droplet transmission mostly. So therefore, as we start the reopening phases, we are urging and reminding and hoping people that the best way to avoid this infection is to avoid close contact in enclosed, poorly ventilated settings, therefore um, uh, avoid large gatherings. Um, uh, so luckily the weather is getting warmer and we should be able to do our activities outdoors, but even outdoors we shouldn't be gathering in, in large groups of people as some of us saw on uh, TV. Are there any questions for Dr. Kojiglanyan? You know, one question that I keep on receiving from friends is they went somewhere and they were exposed to someone that was COVID positive. Um, the question is, when should they be tested? Uh, should they be tested on day one? 
day seven, day 14, and should they self-quarantine? Uh, yes, Larry, uh, I uh, alluded to it quickly, uh, but I will repeat it. So uh, day one will be too early to test uh, such uh, people. So uh, let's say, let's give the scenario. So if you know that you were exposed to someone with COVID-19 uh, the next day, then, uh, then it will be too soon to test you because the incubation period of the virus is between two to 14 days. The peak, though, of, uh, of developing symptoms is between day four and seven. So what I would advise that person who remains symptom free but knows that he or she was in contact with a known uh, COVID-19 person is to go get tested probably around day four. And then if the testing is readily available, repeat that test on day seven. Uh, however, the quarantining rule does not change. Even if you test negative on day four and day seven, you still should maintain the quarantine for those 14 days where the virus could be incubating. If you're someone who's lucky enough to, can, to get tested every day, of course you could, but we know that realistically that's not gonna happen. So we should pick the time that would be, give us the, the most uh, results. And so I would probably pick day, uh, somewhere between day four and seven after known exposure with that person uh, to get tested. May I ask you a question? Of course, Pablo, hi. How, how are you? Is any experience in the uh, United States at hospital level to test regularly weekly, in weekly basis to healthcare professionals or in uh, um, um, places where older people live also uh, consider a high risk group to yes. test them regularly. Sure. So the place where that has been adopted now in New York, in my state, are the nursing homes. So the nursing homes are testing every single person that enters the nursing home twice a week whether symptoms or no symptoms. Obviously, if you have symptoms, you should not be coming. But if you're asymptomatic, you're being tested twice a week. Well, thank you so very much. We appreciate everything you do every day on the front lines, helping our children get better and contributing to the scientific research as well. Um, it's really with great pleasure we're going to introduce our second panelist who also has a University of Pennsylvania Quaker connection, uh, Dr. Kim Hakimian, who got her undergraduate degree at University of Pennsylvania and a PhD under Haratun Armenian at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, she's currently an assistant professor of nutrition and um, at uh, Columbia Medical School. And uh, she has a degree in public health and uh, has given us wonderful insights into the public health aspects of uh, COVID-19. So Dr. Kimian, thank you so much for joining us and again, being so dedicated every week joining us. Thank you so much, and thank you to everybody who is present today on, on this week's town hall. It's hard to imagine how much time has passed since we began these town halls, and, uh, and yet there's so much that we still don't know. Um, on the public health front, there are two issues I'd like to highlight for the audience, and that is that there is ever-growing evidence that is, um, um, that is shining a light on the long-standing issues of health disparities and food insecurity in, in the country. And these issues are at crisis levels. Uh, we're seeing food insecurity levels that are unprecedented in the country. We do have massive food responses, but they are short term. And I think that moving forward, that this is going to become an issue that even some in our communities can coalesce around. Uh, to support communities that need the help for food insecurity. But these would be temporary emergency measures and there is a need to have a national discussion. I think that these issues are common to public health professionals and specialists, but now I think there's an ever growing awareness among the public of the kinds of um, very thin safety nets that had existed beforehand that are stretched now to the point of breaking. Um, there is a study that came out um, from Brookings an Institution, and they, um, they looked at um, food insecure households, and nationally food insecurity has uh, quadrupled since the, uh, since the beginning of March. And it was a shame because uh, food insecurity levels had decreased in 2018 to the levels that they had been 
just prior to 2008 and the financial crisis of 2008. Um, we're obviously at a crossroads, as Larry mentioned, and I know that we're going to be talking about this this evening. The crossroads is, what do we do? How do we open up safely and uh, with what measures? There is extensive guidance in public health field about the kinds of indicators that a state or a community would need to open up. At this time in the United States, really by these guidelines, only three states actually meet the criteria, um, and and yet we're opening up, you know, many others. In terms of mitigation and ways that public health specialists can um, try to uh, control the infection, it is through identifying it early on. There are clusters in counties in rural Minnesota, for example, where there is growing exponentially new cases, and yet the public health departments there were able this past weekend, in particularly in two towns in Rice County, um, one where Carleton College is located, I have uh, a friend who was on faculty there, they were able to test almost everybody in each of those towns. Um, that they, that they felt were at risk. And so this is going to be this staggering opening. Um, what that means for education, I know we're going to be discussing tonight, and Dr. Gorian, one of my you know, areas of interest is, what does this mean for whether or not we can go back safely to our schools? And particularly in my area of higher education, there is um, quite a debate among faculty about the level of risk that is um, acceptable for the benefits of in-person interaction at the higher education level. And I'm sure that you're going to be approaching some of those topics tonight. So thank you very, very much for being here. And I look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. I really uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Belazikian, who will give a formal introduction for Dr. Gregorian. Uh, I've known Dr. Belazikian for over a decade. Uh, he is a tremendous friend. He's a board member of the Armenian American Health Professionals Organization, organizer of uh, continuing medical education credits on the Armenian Heritage Cruise. Uh, and we both have something in common, and that is Dr. Uh, Edgar Hausepian, who was a mentor uh, to him, to me, and to many others. So uh, we want to thank him. Uh, he is, Dr. Belazikian is international authority on disorders of uh, mineral metabolism, such as osteoporosis and hyper and hypoparathyroidism. His publications are really incredible. He has over 875 publications. I don't know when he sleeps. Uh, but the number of publications and quality really speak to his active original investigative initiatives, as well as his authorship of many reference sources of endocrinology and metabolic bone disease. He's the silver... Uh, Silberberg Professor of Medicine and Professor of Pharmacology at the College of Physicians and Surgeons, Columbia University. Uh, he's Chief Emeritus of the Endocrinology Division and Metabolic Bone Disease Program at Columbia and currently serves as the Vice Chair for International Research and Education. Uh, but we all know Dr. Bilizikian uh, for something else. He is Mr. Osteoporosis in Armenia. Uh, he's created a center of excellence. He succeeded where many don't. Uh, against all odds, um, he has created a first-class, world-class osteoporosis program uh, where you have multiple clinical sites to measure bone density. Uh, you have an academic teaching program to teach healthcare providers how to utilize the information they're receiving, as well as conduct research and international meetings. He's really put Armenia on the map when it comes to osteoporosis and bone metabolism. Uh, so without further ado, I'd really like to introduce Dr. John Belazikian. Thank you. Um, you promised me you would only um, give me a few sentences of introduction. Um, you're overly kind. Um, my purpose tonight is actually to, in to introduce our distinguished guest, um, and I will do that. Um, Dr. Gregorian, I know you know a lot of people here. Um, some of them are among your uh, closest friends, but um, some here are not uh, familiar with really what you have done uh, in your uh, truly outstanding career. So if you would indulge me just for a minute, Dr. Gregorian, I am going to uh, formally uh, introduce you to the group. Um, Dr. Gregorian is president of the Carnegie Corporation. Um, he was born in Tabriz, Iran, 
I always think of Tabriz, Dr. Gregorian, because we have a beautiful Tabriz rug in our home. Uh, so just a lovely, classic Tabriz rug. Um, Dr. Gregorian came to the United States um, when he was young, in his, uh, in his early 20s, after receiving his college education in uh, Beirut, and then on to Stanford University, where he received his PhD in history and humanities. Uh, we know Dr. Gregorian as a provost uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, where Larry was training, and then he became president of the New York Public Library, uh, following which he um, uh, became president of Brown University, and then in 1997, Dr. Gregorian became president of the Carnegie Corporation, uh, a position he uh, continues to hold. Uh, his career is truly um, distinguished. I could go on for half an hour just summarizing what he has done. A remarkable record of fundraising, advocacy for education and the arts, and of course, Armenia. Uh, he is a co-founder of the Aurora Prize, and among his many distinctions, awards, and honors, a sampling, and this is just a sampling, include the Ellis Island Award, the National Humanities Medal, the Presidential Medal, Medal of Freedom, and the French Legion of Honor. Uh, I think, Dr. Gavori, you may even speak more than six language, but I counted six. Um, Recognizing your work in Armenia, Dr. Gregorian received the St. Gregory Illuminator Medal and, an, and the Mitchar Gosh Medal. Uh, and uh, the, uh, among his over 70 honorary degrees, he has an honorary doctorate from the National Academy of Sciences. Um, Dr. Gregorian, you really have no equal, um, and we are really i um, very pleased and honored to have you with us. When we were speaking uh, a couple of days ago and a week ago, I was telling you that this, these um, Thursday evening um, sessions include uh, individuals who are experts in healthcare uh, providers. They are psychologists. Many are on the uh, call tonight. We have had experts in virtual uh, telemedicine, artificial intelligence, uh, we have uh, discussed how those of us who uh, practice medicine are going to um, interact with patients given uh, the need, and we don't know how long this is going to be uh, necessary for social distancing. We've had heads of hospitals. We've had lawyers. We've had clergy, both in the United States uh, and from Armenia. And we've had uh, experts in higher education. Uh, but with all due respect to everyone we've had, I don't think anyone comes close to you. And what you have been so gracious to give us your time tonight in an informal way, you're not going to give a formal presentation, but based on your great experience, we would really uh, like to exchange and um, uh, hear from you about um, things that you are uh, really an expert in. We've asked um, those on the call to submit questions we have so many questions that we might be here all night, but of course we won't address all of them. Um, but we are particularly interested in your views. Again, this is the COVID-19 era, and hopefully there will be a post-COVID-19 era. And your views of higher education, um, how do you view the landscape of higher education and how will it change uh, as we think of live teaching, virtual teaching. We're also interested in the arts and the humanities. Of course, you've been a tremendous advocate for those disciplines uh, and um, how you view philanthropy um, in the uh, coming years. We would also love your views about Armenia. Of course, you've done so much for Armenia and how you view the future of of our motherland uh, as we look to the future. So maybe um, those are some of my thoughts about what I would like to hear from you. And maybe you could just uh, touch on a few of them and then there'll be uh, a few more, um, a lot more specific questions as we go forward. Dr. Gregor. Okay, first thing I will tell you, I'm not a doctor, you are the doctors. I'm a PhD in history and humanities. 
So you can call me Mr. Rather than Doctor. We call you the practitioners. I'm not practitioner. But my late grandmother said, what kind of doctor you are if you cannot cure a headache? I finished my high school in Beirut, Lebanon. I kept Stanford for undergraduate degrees. Uh, in humanities, uh, two, uh, you know, graduated from Stanford in human, uh, history and humanities, 1958, with honors. So to answer your question generally, we're all shocked to see the impact of uh, pandemic on the life of the United States. Nobody ex was expecting it. And it has changed everything. I have been uh, for 10 weeks isolated in my apartment. Uh, I have uh, gloves and I have a mask. But even that, I've not been out more than three, four hours. Thank God I'm in a block of uh, New York where there's a pharmacy across the street, grocery across the street, and I don't have to go out for shopping and others. I keep in touch with my staff every way, every week uh, with uh, Zoom. And uh, it's not, it's efficient, but it's not sufficient because uh, one of the things I never thought I would be able to confess to you that my tongue is tired. I've been talking every day, eight to nine hours on the phone. And I know the Armenian expression, the Zoom was scorchy, the tongue has no bounds, so we can, uh, you know, take advantage of it as much as we can. Universities are going to be in danger, to be frank with you. Not all the universities, but public higher education is going to receive a big blow in the United States, in my opinion, because uh, many states are going to run out of cash, out of taxing, and the cuts usually happen are K-12 education and uh, also higher education. So maybe Michigan, Indiana will be spared, but I don't think New York uh, will be spared unless Congress gives aid to states, which until now is uncertain, because they're worried about uh, blue states versus red states and all kinds of politics involved. Second threat to higher education is going to be distant teaching. Uh, because there's no realization on the part of higher education leaders that there's a big commercial enterprise, which is distant teaching, and they can give you degrees for $2,000 and other things and so forth. So if it's supply and demand, credentialing people rather than educating people, you're going to have a big internal national problem in there because they're Corsair and all kinds of companies already can graduate you by offering courses in the topic. They don't have to have uh, X number of professors and others in credentialing. This will not affect professional schools such as medicine, but all the other human arts and sciences and others may be affected by this. We have currently also a scandal of uh, many adjunct instructors in arts and sciences which have no pension, no insurance, no office, and others are kind of like uh, working course per course, being paid by courses. That also may be pretty so increased. So in many ways, unless there is an aid to education from the government, both federal and the state, you're going to have many universities will be facing untold challenges because there is competition already. Phoenix Cal University and other universities, which are national and portable, you spend $2,000 getting a degree, or you, you can say also it's free courses until unless you want credentialing, then you have to pay X amount. So we live in a very period which I thought would not happen. And how do you deal with uh, demand and supply and demand? I remember at University of Pennsylvania, we have a Akkadian and a Sumerian professor, two students. Would the budget people tolerate that, that two students, subfield re, re, requires two students, a professor? All kinds of things are happening. 
Students also, American students are completely in debt, $1.8 trillion of debt by students. Some of them have to pay for 20, 30 years, especially those who are going to go into teaching profession, K-12 teaching. So we face a major national crisis because education is seen as an expenditure rather than as investment. The only time we saw ex 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 education as an investment was during Sputnik time in science and others. But now we see it only as an expenditure rather than investment. So that's my preliminary commentary. I'll be happy to expand on any of the teams you want. So thank you. Those are uh, very um, insightful opening comments. Um, I, I have a list of questions, but rather than me ask them, many of you on the line have asked them, and I would like to just open up um, the uh, program. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and raise your hand and or put the chat box and ask the question that you submitted to me. Uh, Celine, you had a few uh, very interesting questions. Maybe you could start. Um, I think one of my first questions was, um, how do you see the path forward in science specifically? So the advancement of science, innovation, discovery, funding, especially that at least in my you know, lifetime, I feel that there is um, uh, strong anti-science forces. I'm not sure if they, they, are, they were always strong and I'm just now uh, experiencing them myself, or is there truly palpably uh, stronger anti-science sentiment uh, worldwide? So in that environment, how do you envision uh, science is going to progress in this country that uh, is the leader of the, of the world? Well, it's ironic that uh, this should be age of science, but it's age of technology, unfortunately, alone. Public loves technology, gadgets and everything, but they don't appreciate that there's a science behind it in many ways. The only times I saw science being appreciated were we were competing with Soviet Union, and now it may really rise also if uh, what I read in the papers will be about China, that China controls X, Y, Z, we have to be self-sufficient, therefore we have to invest in science. Second thing is, in terms of international cooperation in science projects, more and more I see sense of nationalism, unfortunately, national interest, rather than international solution of some of these problems. Uh, WHO is itself now, America wants to withdraw from it, for example, but thank God other countries are not. They still are invested in it. And then the weak institutions uh, will not be able to contribute unless there is major appreciation of uh, importance of a science solving a certain problem, problem-oriented rather than self. Remember, this is not new. During the uh, 1960s, there was Senator Proxmire who gave Golden Fleece Award to scientists who received three, 400,000. In the Senate, they gave these awards in order to humiliate scientists. One of them, I remember a billion dollar or whatever it was, I forget the amount, to study the mosquito's eye and they made great fun of it. Years later, he had to thank the scientists because they were studying malaria issue. So there is no public promotion of science being one of major accomplishments of mankind, humanity, but rather what is um, immediately applicable. People also forget that uh, internet was the product of Department of Defense and Universities Pact. That's how internet emerged. It was investment in science and in cooperative measures. So we have to educate the public in many ways as the importance. And the ones who have to educate, unfortunately, are not doing. It should be Apple and all the other technologies which have benefited from scientific breakthroughs in technology in order to keep integrity of science and long-term as a long-term investment. Professor Gregorian, uh, my question has to do with Armenia and specifically with the women of Armenia. 
during my Fulbright scholarship at the American University of Armenia, my uh, graduate students and I conducted a uh, research project, qualitative and quantitative, trying to figure out um, what it was that the press was saying in terms of the a lack of empowerment of the Armenian women, whether or not they were really good participants or fair participants in the leadership ranks of the, of the society, and whether or not they were enjoying equity and opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, the results of my study corroborated with those that were being uh, presented by the press or by the stories that were coming out uh, through the press. So my question to you, Professor, is, is there a way that the country or the people of the country can expedite the empowerment of the Armenian woman such that uh, she is able to rise up to her potential? Because in the 21st century global uh, setting or arena, um, Armenia can only compete if everyone in the society is, uh, en is, is empowered enough to participate. So that's my question. It's a very important uh, issue. So let me just comment the following way. First of all, we have not been uh, on our own until recently. We've not been independent and so forth. During Soviet period, emphasis was mostly on males and we had many Armenian heroes marshals, generals, admirals, scientists. I remember especially one of them, Agambekian, who was in charge of the first major computer in Novosibirsk, my bed. At that time, it was men-oriented, male-oriented, I should say. But after the independence of Armenia, issue has been survival rather than thriving until now. And now there has to be a policy and I tell you what we should be done, as just easier to recommend than to do. At Stanford, where I finished my degrees, next to president's office, there was one male secretary, one. His role was to collect from university, professors and others, student names, professors' names, so the president, the dean, the faculty, senate, had, all of them recommended this president for all international and national prizes. One way to start that, it will be to empower universities to nominate women for many international prizes and education opportunities on others. Second, will be universities themselves, government themselves, the way late, uh, uh, Asur Davidian did, taking 300 people to Tufts University. I'm delighted that some of them, almost 25, 30% were women, to learn about government, budget, budgeting, uh, insurance, and all the others, how to professionalize bureaucrats or professionalize public officials. That's where it should begin, universities and others and uh, also to use all external grants. UNESCO, you, you had United Nations, Gulbenkian and others, because the list was always, and I've practiced that, so I don't mind to tell you this, nominating women, nominating others, the Guggenheim Foundation, American Council of Learned Societies and others, always send last minute another recommendation they could not turn down. I, so everybody had five recommendations, mine was six, just in case to ensure. So unless there is organized way of doing this, we would not succeed to live on the opportunities. Because many institutions now, 50-50, men and women, we did our share of talent in the middle. I also recommended years ago that we should teach science and math and computer studies in our armed forces, the way Israelis are doing. So that when you're in the army, you also come out of the army as master of one topic or others. 
I don't know how many people are in the army of in Armenia who are women. I have no idea. But that's the way to approach systemic way to see which United Nations agency, which European foundation, which university has advertised for women. And let's send it. We have nothing to lose by nominating people at the top level. Thank you very much. Just for your information, Professor, uh, the American University of Armenia has instituted a STEM scholarship for women based on the study as well as a women's conference that we conducted there. And uh, currently uh, funds are being developed to be able to support a larger number of women going into science technology. There's one university in the United States, Hunter College, every year on women, Mother's Day, they ask everybody to put fellowship, scholarship in their mother's name, mother's honor. It's thriving. They buy four or five pages in New York Times listing all the people who are supporting scholarship for their mother. Armenia also can do that. On Mother's Day, invest scholarship in women's female students, women faculty and others. And thank you. Thank you. Um, Oscar Tatosian, uh, Oscar, you want to unmute and ask your question? Dr. Gregorian, you've encouraged uh, we Armenians in the diaspora to invest in Armenia, yes. help build the nation. And um, you've also shared that wherever Armenians go, Europe, America, Russia, Middle East, we build those nations. We invest there. And now you say it uh, suggests it's time to uh, invest in our own land. And there's an old saying that money goes where it's safe. Yeah. Money goes where it's safe. So what have you, what have you observed in, in the attitude, in the culture, in the climate of Armenia now that would encourage we diaspora and Armenians to encourage in Armenia, whether it's a large investment or a small investment? What are your thoughts, please? First of all, it has to involve Armenians from Armenia. It has to be partnership. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, second, diaspora has to stop to think that they're giving charity. It should be investment. There's difference between philanthropy and charity. Charity give our a feeling, sorry, uh, trying to help something, alleviate guilt, whatever it is. Philanthropy is to cover the things that cause the need for charity, root causes. So you have to find partners in Ar Armenia and you have to start business in which we have uh, men power or women power already in Armenia. Let's take the computer field, for example. Last year I saw a major international conference on computer in Armenia. People from uh, Taiwan, people from uh, Central Asia coming. We have a tradition of excellence. In medicine, before we started the meeting, I was suggesting why don't we have a, a kind of uh, Mayo style clinic, advanced clinic, to bring the best surgeons once a, year, once a month, once a year. Each one can take one month of vacation to Armenia and they can deduct from their taxes as donation in kind and so forth, all of it. So second, in terms of banking, which is, was my initial idea, if Cyprus can become a bank, we could be better in Caucasus to have a bank which is international bank with Armenian participation to guarantee return and sanct you know, the, uh, that we had other things to do. Third, most important, artisanry. When I was in uh, uh, Tabriz, when in Beirut, lots of silversmith, goldsmith, and all the artisanry to develop it there. We have a better, I always thought we should become, and maybe pipe dream on my part, we should become, once our political situation is settled, the Gorno Karabakh issue is resolved, to make Armenia a Switzerland of the region. Armen Sarkisian president told me, if you want to help Armenia, get an Armenian passport and buy a home or house in Armenia. 
to show that you're part of it without the visiting. Unfortunately, Armenians are very talented. If there's no opportunity to Armenia, they migrate out, Russia first or other countries. Because youth cannot be, with educated youth cannot be contained if there are no opportunities. We have to build opportunities for them. Whether it's from Brazil, whether it's Argentina, whether it's uh, anywhere else. For example, Armenian products, I buy now uh, about yogurt and this and that, and so it could be larger scale now. I understand that China is importing more fruit, for example, from Armenia. I never even thought Armenia is exporting fruit. But anyway, we have to study with experts and invest. Otherwise, it becomes a charity. And also, diaspora should not decide to tell Armenia what to do. People resent that. You don't live here. You come here one week, and then you go back, and then you say what we should do. So we should practice also what we're preaching, investing there. That's my answer. Of course, it's easy to recommend than to do, as you well know. Follow-up question from Ambassador Varuzian. Thank you very much, Mr. Gregorian, also for your wisdom to learn. Oh, it's yes. Great, oh. great pleasure always to listen to you, your leadership, your wisdom for all of us, uh, Armenian community here, uh, us. Don't Armenia. stop. Don't stop, Varuzian. Say more. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, I just wanted to quickly comment on uh, the investments that Oscar asked uh, and uh, on earlier uh, matter that Mr. Gregorian elaborated in the, I fully share his vision that we need to have in our military ser service, uh, a technological IT, uh, you know, unit, but it already exists. I just wanted to inform sure. that some time ago this I'm issue delighted. was addressed and a regiment was created within Ministry of Defense uh, but I, I, uh, uh, it's called technological regiment. Um, but I agree that we need to spread this. We need to make the army a place where we educate our young children, our young people, servicemen, including IT sphere. It's a great, great place to train and educate them, not only to, to fight and defend the, the, the homeland, but also to give them skills, including in the IT sphere. So we need to expand this existing regiment, perhaps in various way. Uh, as regards the investments, I fully share, of course, Mr. Gregorian's uh, vision about investing in Armenia. But what's different about modern Armenia is that the modern Armenia, or new Armenia, as it's uh, often said, you know, uh, is a completely safe destination for investments. I mean, even before this coronavirus, I was talking the other day to a uh, World Bank IMF representatives here in Washington, D.C., they were saying Armenia was doing a fantastic job in the terms of economic progress and economic data. The projected growth for this year was 9%, and even in some sectors, the projected growth was double digit. And uh, first of all, the, the fight against corruption in Armenia is a, is a very strong foundation, a guarantee for safe investment, not only for our compatriots worldwide, but also for any other foreign investors. But our, I agree that our, our compatriots should be the locomotive. They should be the example, especially that now, of course, there has been many frustrations since our independence. Many compatriots came for investments, uh, you know, enthusiastically, and some of them were strongly disappointed and understandably so. But now the modern Armenia in this sense, uh, you know, provides a very, very strong foundation for the protection of investments uh, from the government, that there is no any way that somebody can come and intervene in the business or demand the share or the tax or customs coming and you know doing all kinds of irregularities for the with the foreign investors so in this sense of course armenia modern armenia is completely different and we fully fully welcome and uh, wait our compatriots to come with ideas with investments in these spheres such as it technologies agriculture uh, as mr gregorian said of course armenian products are now extensively being uh, exported to russia even to China, to United Arab Emirates, 
uh, to Qatar, I have seen some, you know, and uh, to European countries. So we have a huge potential, although the country is small, but there are lots of lots of, you know, lands at this point. The other day, Prime Minister Pashinyan was attending uh, some of the farms, farms in Armenia that the people were saying, we not, don't have enough lands. There are lands that people, you know, are not selling, but we need them to use this land. So uh, in other words, we have really good, good opportunities. And I'm hopeful that once this situation, the crisis is over, we will be, you know, again, even now, even during this crisis, we're open for the investments. And any compatriot of ours who's willing to go to Armenia, we will be more than happy to help with our guidance and assistance here from our embassy. Thank you very much. I think Kim is still on the line. Kim Hakimian, you had a question, uh, and uh, <clears throat> Vartan had touched on this about graduate education. Kim, could you um, ask your question? Hi, thank you very much. I mean, you touched upon it in your preliminary commentary, but I can tell you that as a member of various committees within Columbia's structure, looking at trying to make a decision about remote learning um, and trying to make a balance uh, of um, where there are, of course, programs that require clinical um, exposure, those students will get higher priority. But as in the public health sphere, trying to de de-densify the campus, particularly the medical campus, um, in anticipation of a surge. Uh, it looks like we will be going towards remote learning. And my question to you is something that you did touch upon, but if you could expand on that, you can see a very wide range of responses to the coronavirus and people looking at various data and guidelines while they're making decisions about their university's financial future and also the future of social interaction and, so, and the sort of interactive um, on-campus, in-person um, uh, education. So small liberal arts colleges in rural areas have abilities to make somewhat different decisions than large medical school campuses. And yet at, at the same time, we kind of have a moral obligation at this point to try to do everything we can to reduce the surges that we are anticipating will happen in the fall. If, if you have any further commentary on that, that's the push and pull that I'm seeing um, administrators and, um, you know, and, uh, and deans of programs uh, confronted with today. Um, if you have any further commentary or thoughts. Uh, this morning I attended the uh, Colin Powell uh, School uh, for Public Policy of World Leadership and board member there at the City College. And the issue came up from students. If I don't know my professor is a figure on the computer screen, how is he going to help my career or she is going to help my career? When I've never met her, I've heard her voice only. And also, if she's assistant professor, there's a full professor, the eminent professor from Yale giving the same course. I'll register for that. Or something is cheaper, I can do it for that. This may be a phase, but I feel really seriously that we're going to have bifurcation of American higher education, where some of people will get education with all the social and others. You can take humanities courses, S courses, and others. There's an advising office, there's recommending for you fellowships and others. And others have to rely on uh, courses on, uh, I'm not talking every field, that should not technical field, courses which require X amount of tuition per course, which is very high, and going into debt, I can get it in community college, that same course for cheaper, $100. How to keep the quality of the university, not to mention copyright of faculty, what they're teaching until now is guarded. Those are the issues they have faced. And also students this year, I just saw statistics, some 15, 25% would like to get gap year, skip for a year. Some people even don't want to go. Universities, now I won't mention names, some of them have gone to the reject list in order to accept people now. All right, so it's a crisis, financial crisis, 
I don't want financial crisis to become an academic crisis. That's the main thing. Mode of delivery and content. The other thing, as you all know, it's not applicable to Colombia as much. We also have many adjunct people who have PhDs and others, but there's no job. They're teaching course by course. And imagine if they don't teach introductory courses. They have no uh, benefits, no office, and no security. That, that will be another thing. Some of them are skipping there, going. So I feel once the dust is settled, there's lots of cleaning to do, lots of consolidation and others. And also there may be even cooperation between Yale and Harvard or uh, Pennsylvania and uh, Princeton, local universities, how to offer some of the courses together in order to keep the value of introductory and other courses especially. You may face another thing. I'll go first two years in the community college, then transfer to a university to get my degree from university, ex university, because I like to have a degree. But don't also discount all the Phoenix and all the universities, which were one time considered not solid, now reviving so we can teach those courses cheaper. I'd like to just. So I think Carol Aslanyan has a follow up question. Carol? I want to ask a question about international students in the United States. As you know, uh, probably at least 20% of our students come from abroad. And given all the economic constraints now where our traditional students don't have enough money for school, our endowments are down, and now we're going to lose our international pool, which was a revenue pool for many institutions. What do you think will happen to those students? Will they say, oh, I've been accepted to Cornell or Harvard, and I will go even if I'm sitting in my, in my home in uh, Germany because I want the name of the brand. Will we keep those students, or will the competition increase so much that, that you know, all the great institutions, for example, Harvard has 10,000 you know, prestigious day students, but right now it serves 18,000 students for credit degree programs in its extension division and it's face to face what happens when harvard said why can't we put that online i see the competition becoming smaller and smaller for the international market and that it can no longer be uh, uh, guaranteed as a good revenue source for american universities and second, I'm, I'm on the board of the American University of Armenia, so I'm very conscious about this. What happens when all the students we serve there, the three or 4,000, get the opportunity to do their studies at Oxford or at Penn or, or the University of Arizona? Will, they, will there be, Dr. Gregorian, a shrinkage of suppliers now that we're uh, with an online a hybrid or whatever format do you see that happening? Depending on uh, uh, what happens to elections, frankly. Because uh, one of the things that are uh, happening, for example, Chinese students are tens of thousands of students coming to the United States. Now, the way I read in the newspapers, they're going to stop that. Because we don't trust them. They may come and take uh, our secrets or a train and so forth, so on. The atmosphere is very tense there. Second, People from uh, I, uh, Fulbright fellowships now, for example, uh, Hum uh, Humphrey fellowships, uh, all kinds of other, Churchill and others. You may get fellowship is there, but visa is not coming. That's another issue. And uh, you no, know, every every year July Fourth, we put an ad in the paper. Carnegie put a corporation puts a map, a full page ad. Great immigrants. If you take now first servers in many universities, hospitals, and others, many of them are immigrants. How are we going to deal with those those people? Some of them are legal, some of them are legal, and other, all kinds of things. So it's going to be, that's also is going to be a major thing I'm mentioning. 
why should I come to study when I can buy your degree? That's what is facing all universities. And unless, well, something happens, unless next legislation uh, to help people, public, if they include student, assisting student debt, Students borrow, I believe, universities under eighty to hundred thousand dollars or more. Let's say, beginning salary of education is twenty five, thirty thousand. Retiring is seventy five, eighty thousand. So there's the kind of uh, I'm talking five, two, three years late this data. But there are no incentives unless we say every American has to do public service for a year. Three years public service. If, if you go to medicine, medical field, in three years we'll forgive all your debt, medical bill. Unless you invest that way, you got incentives, you'll be leaving vacancies in many issues that you cannot fill them. So this coming year is going to be most important year about higher education, what happens? And also universities have to collaborate with each other. They cannot remain independent sanctuaries, only extra apply. Years ago, there was big fight about whether universities can share each other's libraries. Well, internet made that irrelevant. I do, you don't give me your book from Harvard, I can get it from Vatican. Vatican does not give, I can get it from Alexandria, Library Alexandria. It's internationalization of resources are there. Monopolization is going to be very hard. That's, you're absolutely right, that's going to be a big problem. How we solve it, I don't know. Everybody's waiting to see whether universities will reopen, Notre Dame and others are deciding. Or they may open, try to save money. And students now are asking money back. You told me nine months, you're giving me five months, and you want me to pay full toast? No, so they want back. There are some lawsuits now asking money back. There are some questions about um, the diaspora and Armenians. Um, if uh, Greg Borajans, is he on the phone? Greg, you might want to ask your question. I don't see Greg, but if he isn't on the phone. Um, Richard Babayan, you had a similar question, Richard your question about how do we get our act together and work together? Is that one of your questions about working together in Armenia? Uh, more or less. Um, you know, we have a long tradition of um, individuals and small groups um, working on projects in Armenia. We have multiple NGOs uh, doing similar projects, but we don't seem to have um, any coordination of activities. And I'm wondering if Vartan has any comments um, about how we can um, coordinate efforts, work together, uh, maybe partner with groups that we don't ordinarily work with on similar projects. I don't have uh, expertise in medicine, even though I was the head of uh Penn and medical school and others reported to be including a, a vice president for uh, medical affairs. So I know about it, but I don't know the topic. But let me suggest the following, which I did. When I was at Penn, uh, Soviet Jewry wanted to get out of Soviet Union. They went to Israel, but they did not want to stay Israel. They want to come to the United States. So Israeli university presidents proposed a solution. And we got some private money, started the Pen Israel project, which was the following. You can come summers to spend at University of Pennsylvania from Israel. You can participate in our research projects, NIH and others. The research is carrying your own name. But the moment you decide to stay in the United States, you forfeit everything. So you have to go back to Israel or retain your residence in Israel. It was very effective, especially in sciences. 
because scientists, unlike humanists, they like to share credit with many people. They applied for NSF grants. This thing is really professor's name, as well as visiting professor at the University of Pennsylvania. It was a model which worked for a specific project. When I was mentioning uh, Mayo Clinic, for example, some of you who are great experts in the world can be shareholders of the institution, all right? Uh, you can bring Armenian all over the world expertise, one month, two months thing, because that's what also uh, did in Pakistan. President of Pakistan asked me, why should we spend money sending our students abroad, America, that's where they're going to stay there. So I said, why instead of sending them, bring the best talent in sciences to Pakistan for two weeks, one month, two months, to lecture, to train all your thing. So therefore, you'll be credentialing a certificate or institute, one month institute or specialization. We can do the same thing in Armenia the same way, organizing. You can open a new medical school or expand the current one, make it Russian and English and French, because we are Spanish even from Latin America, make it international thing. Each one of you, as I was suggesting, can commit one month to go, two months, your vacation time, till it holds hold. Because otherwise, uh, frankly, you're, you're being uh, kind of uh, taking care of a wound rather than curing the whole body or selfing the whole body. The I project, I was present from the creation, is a great tribute. Well, Dr. Bilezikian, uh, uh, Bon, all right. We have some of you uh, in terms of former. Uh, <laughs> Uh, head of the urology of the America, entire America. You have all credentials, all the reputation and others. If you can involve some of the professors from there to be your assistants or helping you on a research matter, you can go there with an international money from you, uh, you know, United Nations health organizations from World Bank uh, and others. Somebody had to come together in order to put this thing together and create, uh, create a great thing. It, you're right, it should be organized, institutionalized, and then uh, go, get government's help and get United Nations help and European Union that we're trying to have a regional major center that will satisfy people there. People from Iran also may come from Armenia for real. People of Georgia, people of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all of them will come because there's no such a major talent pool they have abroad. I know this from Nigeria because we have a, a diaspora program with Nigeria. We're telling them people, all right, you left your home, go back to your university in Nigeria, Lagos and elsewhere. Have a PhD exam there, get a PhD thesis the reader, involve them to your research project and others. So now they don't feel guilty. They're helping Nigeria from the United States. There are 20,000 Nigerian PhDs in the United States. And we organize this to help their own universities in Nigeria, and they're doing that. It's not as well organized as Armenians can do because it has emotional part, historical part, that you can build it there with the government support, with issue bonds in the United States, whatever it is, I'm not a financial person, but I know that it can be done with all the talent you have, all the reputation you have. If you, you just use, if I use some of your names, that they all have an enterprise, you can get investment investors also. There's no reason why Qatar, Abu Dhabi would not uh, invest it because not all of them can go to Qatar and Abu Dhabi for different reasons. They can come to Armenia. Anyway, it's easy to suggest, it's very hard to do, but you need a group to organize one field. Let's say I, we do it, all right? Dental, we can do it. But how about urology? 
how come bone, uh, you know, arthritis, with Ezekiel is a great authority. If we don't have to lose anything, you can have one month vacation there, Armenia or two months, and then do good for Armenia, do good for yourself, do good for the country and others. But we have to have a work study group to study all of these things, to have a pact or uh, uh, agreement with the with, uh, Armenian government, attested by and approved or so signed by United States also, so there will not be any kind of uh, saying we're doing an American, why don't you open this Navajo country and other, all kinds of things. Because we remnants of Armenian genocide that we're trying to pay back the country that uh, is lasted for a thousand years, and now we're trying to revive it. That's, now it sounds that of preaching, but underneath there is a program that you can, only you can develop. I saw Mount, Mount Sinai is in front of my apartment or nearby New York. I saw how the, overnight the Mount Sinai, what was Roswell became overnight Mount Sinai. I know the Grossman from University of Pennsylvania. Suddenly he's the head of uh, medical center, not even medical school, like done. You know, I saw this happening. I saw, I see uh, the center for uh, uh, the uh, special surgery. I go there. I see all the doctors I know. They do it because they're organized almost like cooperative. Anyway, we can do it, but it depends to you. You have the talent. Mine is it's easy for me to preach, but who, who was going to build the cat? You know, it's very hard. That's yeah. how you can do it. But please um, feel free to um, ask questions. Uh, I don't, um, don't want to be the one to ask you to ask questions, but um, if you have a question, um, I see Aram Hamparian. Aram, would you like to make a comment? I uh, just really feel blessed to be part of this discussion. It's so very remarkable. And uh, I don't think we have been in a Zoom room with so much talent. So I'm just very impressed to be here. And, uh, you know, uh, we're plugging away on our end, um, trying to see what kind of U.S. resources we can uh, help direct to Armenia, what can be, what of the existing aid programs can be reprogrammed, and what uh, what uh, what additional aid can be provided to Armenia? It seems like the the focus right now on the part of the, the U.S. government is not to help Armenia, um, perhaps with the sort of the the current management of of, of COVID, uh, but more in terms of helping Armenia stand up post crisis, and, um, and that's I think more in the economic realm and in terms of tourism and other things. That, that's the feedback we're getting from from the U.S. government. Uh, but other than that, I'm just, just I, I uh, again, anytime I can be on the phone or on a, on a Zoom call or a video uh, conference with uh, Dr. Gorain is, is a big treat. And uh, there's so many people on this call that I admire so very much. So I'm just, just happy to be here. And, and uh, if, we, if we can be helpful, just, just reach out um, and, uh, you know, give me a call or, or send me an email. And, and we're here to help in any possible way, way that we can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Aram. Uh, we have a few more uh, minutes and a few more questions. Yeah, and uh, somebody, uh, John, yeah, may I ask a question, Dr. Berzikian? Yes. yes, go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Gregorian, really, it's an honor to have you over and uh, listen to you. Um, uh, my question is basically in campuses in science. I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist, and we're involved in Armenia by engineering school and teaching and all that. Uh, having over 70 innovative startup companies in the past 10 years and successful WCIT conference, as you mentioned in Armenia first time last year, an abundance of PhD graduates. What are the key factors for Armenia to be able to successfully export 
it's IT engineering know-how, cos cosmic science research, and other technologies to the competitive world of this time? That's a very worth heartening answer to a question you put. I'm glad you're doing all of that. I was, as you know from my resume, I was part of uh, Qatar Foundation board, one of two foreigners, three foreigners, two Americans and one English. And uh, we brought eight universities to have campuses in Doha. Eight, Georgetown. And it was a plan by them instead of sending their students to stay in the United States, bring the universities there so their students can stay there. And all the universities from Georgetown, Cornell, uh, and uh, Texas, and others, give the same degrees in Doha as they're giving the United States. The build, they insisted building should be built, which they were built by the Qatar government. And uh, they also brought some British and French others. If you say the institute will be formed in Doha, Armenian Institute in Doha, that's the kind of possibility one of universities may consider. That's my guess. Because I stepped down, uh, well, six, seven years ago when Doha became old, now Doha, uh, Qatar found. Qatar citizens, not uh, foreigners. I have good relation with them, but I have kept away from Doha all these years because uh, I spoke freely and uh, the ruler liked my interventions because there was nothing in it for me. I was just, whatever we do, I like to be done well. Armenia is now presence, uh, Varujan can comment on that ambassador, presence in Abu Dhabi and in Qatar. There's no reason, I don't think we have even raised for them to have an institute, a specialized institute between Armenia and Doha that can employ Armenian scientists as well as bring international talent in Armenia. We have nothing to lose by trying but you did government sign the protocol and banks to guarantee that the payment would be made to Armenian government and so forth, so on, Armenian, uh, Armenian partners. But we have to think the way you do. We have to think big. Because if you fail for a big project, it's wonderful. If you fail for a small project, it's miserable. <laughs> to fail for a small project. And I remember one of our poets, Beshiktash now, I forget the name now, in the Ottoman Empire, decided to commit suicide. He was romantic. He, he jumped, he got stuck in mud. He became ridiculed so much that he killed himself because he could not stand the ridicule that he could not even commit suicide. <laughs> so I'm saying we're not committing suicide by trying. Yeah. We have to be well organized all the documents, all the thing, and the talent especially. And if you do that, you can get some Armenian talent from England and in Australia and all kinds of things. I don't think anybody has prepared list of all Armenian scientists in the world. For example, just to begin with, we start doing that uh, uh, years ago and uh, we stopped. But I think they're possible to speak on behalf of all of them if there's physical, physical physicals and others. Armenia has always been strong in math and physics. As a matter of fact, Ambassador can correct me if I'm wrong. Ethnic <laughs> groups during Soviet time, other than people of Jewish background, second largest PhDs in math and science and physics and came were Armenians. I bet Agambekian, he was head of the Sibirsk uh, co computer during the Soviet period. But we never brought cooperation among them in many ways. As a matter of fact, never mind, I'll stop. 
because of answers there. Anyway, there's nothing wrong trying. My question has to do with the um, frustration of public health messaging today and the, um, the I, I guess I'm, I'm asking the question about, is there a terribly new phenomenon, obviously fueled by internet, about this um, fake news and the misinformation and disinformation that makes public health messaging more difficult. I want to just preface this by saying that public health has always been accused of overreach into the personal lives of the individual and taking away rights. For example, the right to smoke. And while I won't go into um, the history of the you know, success in, in tobacco control efforts in the United States, it, it wasn't really until we had smoking bans um, where we got to see changes. Education in and of itself without public policy did not make a change in behavior. We're now witnessing an era where wearing masks, for example, or six feet of social distance is something that people are criticizing, takes away their civil rights and freedom. And we're not seeing that only here in the United States. We're seeing that in many pockets around yeah. the world. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind, as a segue to the next conversation that we're going to have, um, going back to coronavirus and the reality of COVID-19, if you wouldn't mind sharing your thoughts on whether or not this is a phenomenon that we have any chance, really, of overcoming. Listen, I mean, I've read two books now, Snowden and others, and on pandemics, because history is prologue. You have to go to the past. We face the same kind of things. As a matter of fact, quarantine comes from Karant in Italy, 40 days. You know, it's not something new. And each of these uh, pandemics usually has followed by also some authoritarian regimes. Because uh, for the reason you're mentioning, because they could not control it. But I feel uh, that uh, Mayor Bloomberg has a group of mayors around nation who are part of the mayors who are trying to introduce that, that you're not, uh, you don't have the freedom when your freedom interferes with somebody else's freedom. That's right. Right? Then that's not the freedom. It's, yeah, what we say is you have the, we say you have the right to smoke, but you don't have the right to exhale in front of me. Yeah, that was the thing. I mean, if you, yeah. so, so I, I feel uh, that this, uh, will be uh, it's the toughest one this one because uh, we did, were not prepared for it in many ways we're improvising it and also this presidential election year if it was not it was, some issues would be simpler but everybody's worried to get politically incorrect and get people in trouble so I, I feel that this, this is going to have a major benefit for health, for the first time healthcare. Don't be surprised that uh, in the next uh, major budget will include how to help healthcare providers as a class. And uh, certainly we are, at, uh, we are going to have uh, the uh, Aurora Prize in uh, October 19 in the New York, fifth anniversary. And part of it we may be also doing is recognizing heroes who have dedicated themselves to the public. The pressure, 83% of people believe in change. But America has also always been right of minorities too. Not important. The religious element, religious people, 